Foster official was gunned down last week. As John Miller tells us, it's just one in a series of gangland-style murders. It's not uncommon for the general public to both hate and fear mobsters. That's my family, Kate. It's not me. However, when a mobster is hated by both the general public and basically the entire mobster community, you know there has to be something particularly vile and evil about this mobster. This mobster is Samuel Destefano, popularly called Mad Sam, and he is unarguably the most hated mobster in history. In his day, Mad Sam was associated with the Chicago outfit an Italian-American crime family based in Chicago, Illinois. He worked with them as a loan shark but was never an official member of the Chicago outfit, and that's because it was much too unstable for even some of the most dangerous mobsters to contain. They really only kept him around because he was really good at his job of getting people to pay what they owe. And by good, I mean really good. Mad Sam had a taste for blood and the bizarre, so he was more than ready to employ any kind of violent and strange tactic to make sure the debtors coughed up what they owed. His name struck fear in the hearts of every Chicago outfit debtor. So, it is understandable that they wanted to keep him around even though he was a petrifying and unpredictable guy. But for a short while there, this unpredictable guy was a somewhat regular boy. He was born in the very early 1900s, 1909 to be exact, to immigrant parents in Streeter, Illinois. A few years after he was born, the family moved to Chicago, Illinois, and this was where Sam DeStefano's evolution into Mad Sam started. He got involved in some local street gang activities, and sometime in 1927, when he was 18 years old, he got convicted for sexually violating a 17-year-old girl. He got three years for that offense, but it did nothing to change him because he would go on to spend many more years in prison for a variety of crimes. And this was made easier by his decision to join the 42 gang right after getting out of jail the first time. The gang was composed of teenagers and young men and served as a kind of recruitment base for the mob. By the time Mad Sam joined the 42, the gang was led by Sam Giacana, who would go on to be a Chicago outfit boss. As a part of the gang, Mad Sam engaged in all sorts of illegal activities, including gambling, robbery, and bootlegging. And in 1932, as the gang attempted to rob a grocery store, he got shot by a policeman. Later that year, he appeared in a hospital on the west side of Chicago with bullet wounds that he refused to explain. By 1933, Mad Sam was back in prison, this time around for robbing a bank in New Lisbon, Wisconsin. He got 40 years for the robbery, but in December 1942, the then governor of Wisconsin, Julius Hale, commuted his sentence, causing him to be released in December of 1944 after having spent 11 years in jail. But he might as well have been left there because just three years later, he was back in prison for possessing counterfeit sugar ration stamps. This sentence was spent in Leavenworth Federal Penitentiary, and this was where he met Paul Ricker and Louis Campana, two members of the Chicago outfit. Mad Sam got released that same year, but he had already caught the interest of Ricker, and he essentially took him under his wing, showing him the loan sharking ropes. Loan sharking brought in a lot of money for the outfit, like it does for every other mob. Learning the skills virtually made Mad Sam for life. Now, it must be mentioned at this point that while a Mad Sam was definitely unhinged, he was an astute businessman. Even before joining the Lone Shark line of business, he had been judiciously investing his earnings from his other illegal activities, especially one really big bank robbery that he was a part of in the 1930s. I mean, how else would you explain his decision to purchase a 24-suite apartment building and rent the different rooms out? What's more, he didn't spend the rent money on lavish lifestyle. Instead, he decided to start covering his tracks by donating money to support local politicians, judges, and police officers. Obviously, he didn't have that many on his payroll by the 1940s, which is why he was in and out of jail at the time. But, as a lone shark, he was able to earn enough to buy the right kind and amount of people that he could boast of being able to fix any case and mean it. He wasn't just fixing cases for himself, though. He fixed cases for some other criminals as well. He did that for a fee, though, and his fee ranged from $800 for a robbery to up to $20,000 for a first-degree murder. In fact, at the time, he had so many police officers in his pocket that the police would arrest a criminal and, instead of taking them to jail, drive the person down to Sam's house. Once in Sam's house, the officers get paid, 
while the criminal gets constricted into Sam's loan collection army. By the 1960s, Mad Sam was one of the most successful and untouchable loan sharks there was. But being a loan shark was not only a money-making venture for Mad Sam, it also offered him the opportunity to satisfy his thirst for violence. While many loan sharks really only lent money to people that they believed stood a good chance of paying, Sam was more interested in lending money to high-risk clients because in addition to making money, that way he was more likely to find victims to torture. There are many stories about Sam torturing people and one of those stories, as reported by Gangsters Inc., was his torture of Peter Cavaletti. Cavaletti had tried to make up with the $25,000 that Sam had lent him. Unfortunately for him, Mad Sam found him in Milwaukee, brought him back to Chicago, and took him to Mario's Restaurant in Sicily, a restaurant that was owned by Sam's brother, Mario Destefano. Mario was also in the mob community, so he had a convenient basement in his restaurant where tortures could happen. Sam, his brother, and two of his collectors, Charles Grimaldi and Sam Gallo, stripped Cavaletti, handcuffed him to a radiator, and proceeded to beat, burn, and torment him for days. But weirdly enough, that wasn't the worst of it. After the three-day torture, Mad Sam decided to throw a party in the restaurant while Cavaletti was almost completely gone in the basement. The party was well attended by judges, politicians, police officers, and members of the mob. And to make things even more twisted, Cavaletti's wife, family, friends, and colleagues were in attendance as well. Apparently, after the dinner, Mad Sam told the guests in attendance about how Cavaletti had tried to run away with his money and how the guy was lucky to still be around. Then they brought Cavaletti out of the basement naked, blooded, burned, and dripping in urine, and threw him in front of his wife. Mad Sam is also said to have been involved in the death of local restaurant owner Artie Adler. This one is singled out because Adler apparently did not die from the agony. He died from a heart attack, which must have been devastating for Sam, who would have loved to torture him to death. He got to kill a lot of other people, though, including debtors who owed small amounts just so they served as a deterrent to the bigger debtors. And he also killed his own brother, Michael, who was also part of the mob that the outfit needed to get rid of because he had developed a drug habit which made him a liability. Mad Sam did not only look to his debtors to satisfy his thirst for violence, though. He was also really violent at home. It is said that one day, after an argument with his wife, Anita, he went out, grabbed a man, brought him to his house, and forced the man and his wife to perform oral intercourse on each other at gunpoint. But Mad Sam isn't just infamous for his thirst for violence. There are people that believe that Mad Sam was a devil worshipper, with one of his associates reportedly saying that he once saw him rolling on the floor and asking the devil to command him. It was also rumored that he used to urinate in the coffee of an FBI agent who used to come to his house to try to turn him. And that was after he had first welcomed the agent into his house with his pants unbuttoned and everything out in the open. So altogether a weird guy, and it's all the weirdness and violence and general thirst for blood, of course, that made the Chicago outfit refuse to make him a made man. In fact, all of this eventually led to his demise in 1973. But the countdown to his demise started in 1963 when he, his brother Mario and two other mobsters, Tony Spallatro and Chucky Grimaldi, killed Leo Foreman. Mad Sam would have continued to live life as a free man, and he did do that for about a decade because almost everybody was on his payroll. But Grimaldi eventually informed the FBI about the murder, leading to the arrest of Mad Sam, Mario, and Spilatro. True to his character and nickname, Mad Sam was totally unhinged. He tried to represent himself, wore pajamas to court, arrived on a stretcher, and spoke through a bullhorn. At this point, Mario and Spilatro knew that they didn't stand a chance of walking free if they remained tethered to Mad Sam. So, they told him that they had found Grimaldi's hideout and wanted to meet in Mad Sam's garage to discuss strategy. Unfortunately, when the two men arrived at the garage, it was not to have a discussion. Spilotro shot Mad Sam twice and the two men left him to die. Well, at least it wasn't the brother that did the killing this time around. The way Mad Sam died is indicative of how hated he was by his own circle. And this was amplified by the fact that there was hardly anybody at his burial. This was quite disappointing for the FBI and the Organized Crime Unit of the Chicago Police Department, who were monitoring the whole thing in hopes of finding out some of Mad Sam's associates. But none of them were surprised at all.
Do you think Mad Sam Destefano is the most despised mobster in history? If not, let me know who down in the comments. If you like this video, then check out the videos on the screen for more. I'll see you here next time with something new. See you next time.